So I, I first came to town and started directing theater. And my sister Ursula and I did a show that uh, we produced. I actually didn't direct that. I was, I was in it. But A, my name is Alice, mm. and it ran a very long time, almost a year, in three different venues in town, and was considered a big, big success, and we pretty much lost money week after week after week. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, oh my goodness, if this is theater, if this is successful theater, maybe it's time to move and, you know, take the jump and try and do a film. Right. You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This week I got to talk with Maria Burton. She's a film director. She's directed such things as Temps, Just Friends, Manna from Heaven, and the upcoming For the Love of George. Sometimes I sit down for these talks and it feels like we're already best friends and just dive into such a deep and juicy conversation. And this was one of those times. And this interview is kind of long. So grab your cup of tea, settle in, have a listen. What is your job? I am a film director and producer. Now, how did you get that job? Tell me the whole story. I went to Yale for theater and film because I knew that I wanted to go into this business. And in fact, when I was in high school, I wanted to not go to college and just come out to Los Angeles and start working in film. And my parents said I had to go to college. So I said, (laughs) okay, how about I go to USC or UCLA and I'll be in Los Angeles and I'll really be working in film. And my dad's from California and he didn't have anything against it. He went to USC, so he was fine with that, but I think my guidance counselor called up and said, I think she could go to an Ivy League. And I was from a very big public high school with like 500 kids in my graduating class. Wait, where did you grow up? uh, Outside of Buffalo, New York, Amherst. Anyway, I was encouraged then to go to Yale because it had such a good theater program. And I'm the eldest of five and I knew nothing about applying to colleges and I just applied and got in early and didn't realize that I had anything to have been nervous about until I got there and I thought, oh my goodness, here so I am all these amazing it. people. Yeah, I thought nothing Oh, I'll go to Yale, no big whoop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my mom was saying, shouldn't you apply to some other schools? And I said, mm, why? Yeah. So anyway, I got in and it was the perfect place for me because they do have such a spectacular theater program, but they're also um, liberal arts, which I recommend to kids now when they're going to colleges, is don't just focus on one thing. Get the liberal arts education because it will make you a better human being. And especially in this business, when you want to tell stories about life, you should have life experiences. So it turned out just to be so great, but they didn't really have a film program at the time. Now, were you focused on acting or some other part of theater? Uh, Acting and directing. Okay. So I ended up double majoring in both theater and film, and I had to create my own film special divisional major, uh, which at the time was a lot of semiotics and uh, things to make it seem more intellectual than practical. But uh, it, was, it was fantastic. And then when I graduated, I came out to Los Angeles. Cause <laughs> Finally. <laughs> yes, exactly. And initially I worked, well, while I was still in college, I started working for Sundance. Um, it was a new organization, but I read about it and thought, this is so spectacular, these uh, independent film, Robert Redford. Yeah, what were you doing to them? I'd read about the June Lab and wanted to participate in that. And they said, we are never going to bring you out here. It's such a small thing and we have to really vet people before we bring them. And then they said, but you know, we could maybe bring you in for the film festival because we have a little stipend, we can uh, put you up. You can see movies while you're taking tickets at the door, you know, but uh, we won't. We still won't hire you for the June Lab, but we won't feel guilty about it because you'll have a good time <laughs> at the at the festival. 
And then they did bring me back for the June Lab, which was amazing. It, it's it just, it was the beginning, I think, of my really understanding independent filmmaking. Now, I don't know what the June Lab is. They have a month where they bring in independent filmmakers and they have mentors and they work with them on the script. They, they bring in spectacular actors who they work the script with them. Then in the final week they bring in um, uh, finance people and they try and get things set up. So it's in this very intense month, all aspects. I was... Fantastic. Doing essentially PA stuff. It's Utah, so I had to drive far to get the booze for people. <laughs> uh, making sure that people were greeted and taken to their rooms. And, and then I ended up having that kind of job with the film festival for 13 years, where I was kind of liaison to the stars, take people skiing if they needed to go skiing, take people out to dinner. And it was great. It's like, you know, David Lynch taking him out to dinner, Jodie Foster taking her cross country skiing, you know. The, that seems okay. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> did was, you live there year round or did you just go out for all. the festival? I just went out for the festival. And I kind of grew up with it because many of the people I started with became the full time people. I didn't want to do that because I wanted to be a filmmaker. So, for me, it was just perfect to go there for a couple weeks every January yeah. and immerse myself in independent films. And meet all the people. And meet all the people, right. And so like Steven Soderbergh, there this, there's the story he always tells about when he first was, went there and he worked as a driver. And I was working as a driver, so we hung out. And then uh, Sex, Lives, and Videotape was playing and I went to see that first screening and I'm sitting next to him. Steven, this is a really good movie. And <laughs> I hope it does well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, but that was what brought independent filmmaking kind of burst onto the scene yeah. after that movie in Sundance. And um, so it, it just was starting in those early days. And then as it became so big, I, when I returned, I still knew so many people from the beginning that I was able to have a great experience and then I stopped going I think I, I started when I was actually directing my own films I just didn't have the time to do it but then I've been back twice in the last decade once as a mentor for Global Girl Media with uh, these young women, one from South Africa, the, the idea is you mentor them to teach them citizen journalism and it gives them a voice. And so one was uh, from South LA and I'm bringing them in and they're interviewing Redford and Gloria Steinem and all the movie stars of that year and it just amazing yes and and they don't even really know who these people are yeah but the people are loving them because they're so authentic and not just the regular press they're mm -hmm. young women who have genuine questions yeah that they've come up with that you know aren't going to go into whatever magazine and so it was it was pretty Incredible. neat um and that was one. Oh, and the other time I went back with uh, Alliance of Women Directors. I was co-chair of Alliance of Women Directors for six years, and we had a big event there. And so that was, it was nice to go back, but it is so different from what it was yeah. when I when well, I it's used grown to go. so much, has yeah. it? And yeah, which is, you know, that's great. That's success. But it's not, I think it's harder for people when they just go to have the same kind of random sit-downs with the filmmaker who they just saw their screening yeah. because there's so much dealing going on. And does it feel like it's a little bit less truly independent than it used to be? Yes. It seems like all the studios yes. and then arms send their films. Yeah. It yeah. feels like. Yeah. Okay, so when you were in town, how did you become a director? So I, I first came to town and started directing theater, and my sister Ursula and I did a show 
that uh, we produced. I actually didn't direct that. I was I was in it. But A, my name is Alice, mm. and it ran a very long time, almost a year, in three different venues in town, and was considered a big, big success, and we pretty much lost money week after week after week. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, oh my goodness, if this is theater, if this is successful theater, maybe it's time to move and you know, take the jump and try and do a film. Right. And so I did my first film, uh, romantic comedy Just Friends uh, in 97 on a shoestring and how did you get financed for that? I was working at a law firm as a legal secretary just to pay my bills and they were very supportive of my doing it and uh, gave me time off and some of the lawyers invested in it and I made them a good return back, as it turned out, partially because I was able to do it for so little because I was also sponsored by Kodak and Deluxe and Panavision. Okay, um, back up. Okay. Did you work your way up on film crews, or did you start as a director? I started as a director. Okay. How? Talk about how you pull this all together. Well, I really think it was from observing at Sundance and observing um, when I had acted on other sets and having taken film in college and made short films in college. So I was able to show one of those shorts to um, Bud Stone was the, the head of, of um, Deluxe. And he was very supportive of young filmmakers. And so he's the one who brought Deluxe in to sponsor me and then picked up the phone and said to the guy at Kodak, hey, I'm helping her out. This is, it was 35 millimeters. Yeah. So, you know, can you give some film? And, and, um, and then Panavision with the cameras. And, and Panavision has always had a really great program of supporting first time filmmakers. And so, I, I had um, 65,000 feet of film, I think, and I, I basically shot listed and storyboarded the way I knew Hitchcock had edited it beforehand. Like, yeah. I knew I'm going to get these two sentences with this shot, and then I'm going... So, I was super so prepared. careful with my film. And I would just cut people off. That's all we have. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> okay, that's cut. And it, it's so different with digital now, and I love digital because of it. It's so fun to just be able to roll the camera and give actors leeway. But at the time, I was going to get that film shot on the film that I had. Yeah. It's like if and, Woody Allen will give someone two lines, like not even the script, say this. Yes. You're that's done. basically how it was. I mean, they yeah. had the script, but they... But it was this angle, these lines on this angle, and that's it. And if I, I would always do a, a safety take, but if I had it, I wouldn't shoot anymore. Wow. Um, yeah. So. And on um, the one hand, that's really confident for a first time filmmaker. I was very confident. I was so prepared. Yeah. I, I just had to be. So, um, but I, I knew that I knew what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So, that was my first film, and it sold for a, a premiere on television to um, the WE channel, it was an offshoot of AMC, and uh, did very well for the investors, and in fact, I also went back to hey, all my crew and actors had points or deferments, mm -hmm. and I went back and paid them actually three separate times, and they kept saying, they shocked? really? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> they were like, no one does this. I said, really? <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> and SAG brought us in, my sisters and I, they, they took us to lunch, and they introduced us to everyone, because they said, no one voluntarily <laughs> comes back and pays everybody. And anyway, so um, it was a good experience for me and a lot of positive reinforcement from all the people that I was able to yes. pay. And um, uh, I had worked, as I say, I'd worked with 
uh, my sister Ursula on the uh, play that we'd done before, and she had been acting in Just Friends, but she came on board then as a producer, and my sister Gabrielle had just finished film school in France, and she had started on the film as my assistant, but ended up being a producer, and they were so spectacular, because I think your sisters, I mean, first of all, I have amazing sisters, but I also think it's such a difficult thing to produce a movie on a shoestring. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult, <clears throat> always. But when you are pulling off what we were pulling off on so little, it, it was great to have them to lean on because I was getting four hours sleep a night and there just truly weren't enough hours in the day. So, yeah. um, But you must have a shorthand, you get each other... Yes. You know what each other's thinking. Yes. So so then what happened is we did, the next film was a movie called Temps that my sister Gabrielle wrote, and all five sisters, my, my other two sisters came on board. We shot that in Boston. We were living in my sister Jennifer's teeny house while she was uh, going to grad school. And now how was that one financed? Each film has been a bit easier to finance because after you have a track record, it's easier to go back. And so we had private investors and some from the first film, some new people, but it was easier to show them, yeah. look, we, we've we delivered this. And also, one of the things that they say is proving that you actually can deliver the film. A big mistake that indie filmmakers often make is they spend all their money in the production and they don't save enough for the post-production or nowadays for the marketing and distribution, which right. is so huge. And because we had the experience, I mean, with each one, it, it's made it easier. I'm sort of jumping ahead, but definitely having made money on Just Friends, it was easier than to go out and raise money on Temps. For sure. So, but again, done on a shoestring. Um... And that we shot on Super 16 in Boston. A very fun experience. I'm really proud of that film. And, and we, it was scooped up by CA to turn into a TV series. And so we went and had all these meetings with various uh, companies to take it in and pitch as a show. And it ultimately never happened. And so the movie's never really been seen. And mm. I'm actually... One of the things that we have on our plate now is to get it out there now that things can be streamed on yeah. iTunes and Amazon and whatever. And I'm I'm happy that it can be shown because I'm really proud of that film. It was kind of uh, not that that term was in common use, but mumblecore. It was kind of like an early mumblecore type mumblecore. Um, mumblecore, you know, these indie films where well, slice of life, and oh. you know, it was a quarter life crisis. Five twenty somethings. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'm oh, very that. proud of that film, and and it would have lent itself really well to a TV series. Yeah. But it, you know, most TV things they never happen, so it makes sense. I'm just happy that now, instead of the movie having sat there, it's like don't do anything with it because it can be the backdoor pilot, and then right, right, right. no one ever saw it ever. Now well, have it you can talked be now seen. to Hulu and Netflix? Have you talked to those guys? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's exactly what we need to do. Yeah. So. Um, so that was the second film. And then the third film, uh, after having done Temps, we all said, let's make this an official company. And yeah. so we formed Five Sisters Productions, where we had to have serious talks about how we would run it, because I'm the oldest, I couldn't be the big boss. And everyone had to be able to do... Like, basically, we all were producing so that we could do our artistic things that we loved. And... Because I had more of a track record, having directed the first two films, it would be easier to go back and raise money. It, it, we couldn't just keep it being like, oh, Maria's making movies and the rest of us are supporting her. So yeah. we had to figure out how to... How's that dynamic going to work? Juggle that, right. And how do you keep your... How do you manage your family dynamic within that company dynamic? Which I think is true for all family companies because you always have uh, you know the weekends and the holidays where you're still talking about yeah. work and 
we would say, no, talking about this at Christmas time, and of course we would be. And in some ways that's okay because we all love it. And yeah, it's your passion. So, you know, it's it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's also difficult to Sometimes you need leave work at work. Yeah. Um, like, who are you going to go complain about your office to? <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Luckily, we all love each other a lot, though I'm always joking. There's that sick sister we don't talk about, but there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine if there was. I know. I'd be like, hey, you guys. <laughs> um, oh, so so the third film, yes. Man from Heaven. My mom, who is uh, uh, was an amazing novelist, loved movies, too, and decided she wanted to come back and go to AFI. And she was, at the time, the oldest student AFI had ever... How old was she? She was 55. How and wonderful. And I believe now they are taking in older students, but at the time it was a big like, decision. What? Are we going to bring someone in this old? And then she ended up being their star student that year. She was only planning to go one year. They asked her to come back. She, was, she won the Mary Pickford Prize, and they said, come back the next year. My dad was on sabbatical, so... The next year, he had to go back. He was a professor at um, SUNY at Buffalo. And so they commuted for the year while she stayed the second year. And then she won the Nickel and the Austin. Oh, my God. Screenwriter Prize. She, she was amazing. And so we got one of her scripts, and that was Manna from Heaven. And that's what we produced. And it was set in Buffalo. And so we all went back and produced that. And I co-directed that with my sister, Gabrielle. So... Again, it's interesting, I I think this has changed a bit, but at the time, the DGA would only allow co-directors if they were siblings, because I think it's kind of that same brain thing. And it definitely was true with us as siblings. Yeah. They still make people go through a big process if they want to be co-directors, but they've opened it up beyond people who are related to each other. But I do think there's something, when you're siblings, that... You very much can have the same brain. Yeah. I can, I can get how that would happen if, like, you have the same references. Like, you may both remember an episode of Sesame Street you were watching, you know, years ago that triggered some memory. You were like, yeah, got it. And people often say, like, every time we go do press stories all together, people often are like, how do you do it? I can't even get through a lunch with my sister and maintain civility you know the, yeah. the, so I, I realize that this is not always the norm and uh, that some people have that and some people don't it's pretty special especially five of you That's I've come remarkable. to appreciate it yeah it was something we took for granted and now we really do yeah. appreciate it okay so, okay, so Manna from Heaven you're so co-directing co-directed that in Buffalo and then were you all staying in your childhood home? Yes, we were, and it was a lot of fun. And I actually came to fall in love with Buffalo in yeah. a way that I had not been in love with the city when I'd been in high school because I'd uh, been born in um, Washington D.C. and then moved to Buffalo, and Buffalo seemed very boring compared to D.C. Of course. So when I went to college, I just felt like. Good riddance, Buffalo. <laughs> and then, going back and shooting a movie, I think what always happens, at least for me, when I shoot a movie in a place, is you fall in love with the place. Yeah. Because you do the location scouting, and you see everything about it. You get and, in. Yeah, and you meet all the people, and you really... There's... You're, you're immersed in a city in a way that, the, even if it's... The, the best and the worst, it's still so interesting yes. and fun. I would like to see the documentary of all of you in your childhood home making this movie. That's what I want to see. <laughs> you know, documentaries are so boring on us because there's no real drama. We're not sleeping with each other's boyfriends you're or husbands. You're getting along and having and, a good time. Yeah. <laughs> boring, yeah, you're right. <laughs> we, uh, we did a little mini-doc thing for... The Learning Channel, I think it was, or Lifetime or something, and and they had us, they, it was so staged, you know, it's like, in the morning you'll write the script, and then in the afternoon you'll cast, and then you'll film it, and then you'll have a screening the next day, and you'll toast each other with champagne, and we're like, if, it was so interesting, because basically we just <laughs> sit around at our computers all day, and you know, the majority of the time, it's yeah. not quite so So it's not exciting. the of a reality show. Right, right exactly. <laughs> so they tried to spark it up a little bit, but the essence, it's, it's pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so what we did do that was interesting with that movie is we had maybe 35 offers from distributors, but we could see that they were all going to be the kind of thing where they would open it in 10 cities for two weeks and that would be it. And then it would be on TV and the, yeah. And we had all these wonderful, uh, an ensemble of actors, Shirley Jones, Cloris mm-hmm. Leachman, Wendy Malick, oh uh, Shelley Duvall, uh, Austin Pendleton, Seymour Cassell, Frank Gorshin, Harry Groner. Okay, that um, doesn't belong on the shelf. Louise Fletcher. Yeah. And so we thought, um, and we saw how audiences respond to it. It was a feel-good, old-fashioned kind of movie. My favorite review was uh, NPR called it Capra-esque. And so I was like, yes, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but it, an old-fashioned sweet movie, yeah. you know, not your indie, not a Sundance kind of movie. That, and and not I say, having, having grown up with Sundance, I love Sundance, but I knew that this was, yes, not gritty. This was feel-good, sweet, Yeah. and there's a huge audience out there for that. Me. That's all I want to watch. <laughs> so... We ended up signing with these bookers who had approached us early on, and we said, no way. We do not want to be involved with distribution. Sounds like a nightmare. We're exhausted from having produced the film. Do we have to do everything? Yes, exactly. (laughs) But then after looking at all our uh, distribution offers, as I say, we thought, you know, this movie deserves more of a life, more of a theatrical life. Yeah. So we went back and talked with these bookers and formulated a plan where we worked with them to open it. What, what they, they had a brilliant plan to open in Branson, Missouri, which I'd never even heard of Branson, but it's in the middle of the country and it's a tourist capital where people are bussed in from all over. And it's kind of like vegas without the drinking it's this really it's it, they have this strip with all these country music stars and busloads of people just day after day are unloaded in going to all these shows and they love like andy williams was you know had a permanent show there and um, like things people in california don't know Right. I had never heard of it. And then you think, how could you not know about this thing that's so middle America? But it's, I think, being in California and having been from New York before, I didn't really know this part of middle America. It's in the flyover zone. Yes, yes. (laughs) So we went there, and it was a brilliant strategy on the part of these bookers because people came to the movie and then got back on their buses and went Went back to wherever they were from and wanted the movie to come. Yes. So we were supposed to be there two weeks and then move to Kansas City, which was close by for two weeks, and then move somewhere else for two weeks. But it ended up running for two months in Branson. And so we still had to open in two weeks in uh, Kansas City. And we this was still back with the prints, the thirty five millimeter prints, so we had to order another print. And yeah, how many prints did you have? We had one, and then we had two, <laughs> and then we had six because it expanded in Kansas City because it was doing so well. And at the time, AMC movie theaters were based there, and the people in the office were looking and saying, "What is this little movie we've never heard of?" That's doing great doubling every week just from word of mouth and so the CEO came and checked it out and he really liked it and and he came incognito like we didn't even know and, and then he came up afterwards and he introduced himself and we were there handing out flyers in yeah. line we've been doing local PR the idea was like the old-fashioned way of you know like a, a music tour or something yeah. where you go to the place and people loved the idea that we were a family and five sisters and so we were doing these local interviews and what what year was this 2002 I think I, I don't know I'd have to look back because it was it we went for a whole year so it was around somewhere between 2001 and 2003 but this it 
it was uh, it started in Branson. It went to Kansas City, and then when we had AMC behind us, they opened in six more theaters there in, in around um, Kansas City, and so we had to get those prints. But it was still kept running. So instead of closing after two weeks, where we could move the prints, we were extending too. and adding. And what was so great about <clears throat> getting AMC's support is he promised good poster placement and uh, trailer play, which was yeah. huge. Yeah. Studios have people calling up and asking for the trailer to be played closer to the feature. Yeah. And so the fact that they were behind us and excited for us just made such a difference. And still it would be difficult. Like once we went into a theater where the manager was so excited and he brought us in to show us where the trailer was. And and again, back in film, they spliced the trailers in. Yeah. And we had to order each trailer too. <laughs> so we're ordering those and FedExing them around. And so he brings us in and it's not our trailer and it's not our trailer and it's not our trailer. And we're thinking, wow, it's going to be the one before the movie. And then the movie starts. He's hey. like, whoops. And he was, he <laughs> brought us in to show us because he was excited, but it just hadn't been spliced in. And they don't have. He I intends mean, to put it in. He intended to. And, you know, so, but you don't have the studio people there checking up on this also. We were doing all this ourselves and going around the country and it was such a great but exhausting experience yeah and um we ended up going to all around dc all around boston buffalo of course um but we were asked to go to other places and we just got too tired and we wanted to move on and make other films yeah and we made a good chunk of money for what we'd done. We were in 40 theaters at one point and we made over half a million dollars theatrically, which is better than a lot of indie. Yeah. Um, and what was the budget? The, low. I don't know anymore. But, um, so you made your money back. Um, actually, what we did was then we went back to our investors and we asked if we could kind of blow it all. Like, we were rolling it over into uh, the, the marketing. Yeah. And since we opened in the middle of the country, then we ended in New York and L.A. And they were very expensive. Yeah. Like, to be in the AMC and Regal theaters, they required you to have a certain amount of spend. And you had to do it. So... We talked to our investors, and they were excited like just to have it out and do that. Yeah. And, and so that's what we ended up doing. So even though money was made, money was spent. So at any point, does a studio come in and say, hey, let's so then, distribute this? Then it was picked up by MGM, um, and which was then acquired by Sony, and they took on the, the DVD. Okay. And so we were very excited because it had that lion yes. roar in the front. and. Which also seemed very appropriate since it was that old-fashioned fable yeah. kind of movie. So, yeah. Wow, great. So, have you continued to kind of produce your own things, or are you doing work for hire? So, the, the idea stuff? with Five Sisters Productions was to be this umbrella company where we would do our own passion projects and all help each other. And Now, is everybody a director? More or less, well, my sis, my youngest sister Charity is a school teacher full time, mm -hmm. and she teaches dance in the LA public schools. So she comes on board with us when we're in production. Everyone else is five sisters or film full time, uh, but in different ways. My sister Ursula is mainly an actor, though she also is a, a marvelous director and and uh, writer herself, and has done shorts and we've all done commercial campaigns where we all do directing, writing, producing together. Um, Gabrielle, as I said, had, had uh, gone to film school in France. She just finished a movie, a documentary that she's worked on for a number of years called Kings, Queens, and In-Betweens about the spectrum of sexuality shown through the lens of drag in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And it's a wonderful film. And has been doing really well on the festival circuit. Yeah. Um, and my sister Jen 
a couple years ago went back. She was here in California, but her husband's a neuroscientist, and so he was working at the Neurosciences Institute in uh, La Jolla, and it closed, and he was wooed to, to be a professor at Tufts, mm -hmm. and Jen was wooed to be a professor of film there, too. So she has been juggling Five Sisters Productions' work with teaching at Tufts, and actually we've been doing a number of projects with the students there, which has been great. Oh, fantastic. Um, we did a, a, a thing that started as a web series called Old Guy, that the idea was to give their the students uh, experience working with professionals. They came, they, we did some of it in Boston, but then they came out and we worked here in LA, and it's been a really great experience because one of those students then I brought her on to the film I directed in Louisiana a couple years ago, which is called A Sort of Homecoming, and she was just an assistant editor, but she's so talented. She ended up being a co-editor because the editor, who was the main editor, recognized how talented she was and generously said, I should share this credit with her. It's no no skin off my back to, to share it. It's incredible. And, yeah, and, uh, and now has brought her with her now she's um, editing in TV and, and has brought the co-editor to work with her as her assistant on the TV shows and so fantastic you know, it, that's someone who came out of Tufts but we recognize how great she was and now she has this great career uh, so tell me this what is your take on the state of women directors in America <laughs> I'm pause. pregnant pause um, where to start? You know, it was great uh, working with AWD. That's the Alliance of Women Directors. Because I was exposed early to all the studies mm -hmm. as they started happening. The Gina Davis Institute with uh, Stacy Smith, the stuff that she's doing, and you have to interview her. The studies she is doing and has done for the last decade have made such a difference because... First, I think it just felt to women looking around like, well, maybe it's me. Right. And then... And feelings are so different from data. Right. And what am I doing wrong? And what should I be doing differently? Because if I just work harder, it'll happen. Or talk to happen. me. Or... Right, right. And then you see this data and you say, oh, it's between 2% and 6%. Of women directing the feature films, or you know, Does now they mean, had the the studios that have zero women on their slate. Come on, <laughs> you know. But yes, it's not me, right. and and it's not all those amazingly cool other women directors I know who I look at them and say, why aren't they working more? Right. And uh, and then in TV, it's still it's better, but you know, it was hovering around eleven percent, and I think it's jumped up to maybe 16% or I don't know if you know the whole thing of what happened when uh, the original six in the DGA uh, or I'm going to publish next week my interview with Maria Geis and here's a quick update you can now listen to Maria Geis and learn all about the original six in episode 11 on the other 50% what happened is when they made it people aware that it was half of 1% and through pressure, things started changing, and it was jumping up a percentage point a year, and that's where it got up to 16%, and then it slid back down. And it's like, come on, how can it slide back down? I, because we're done. Problem solved. Let's stop thinking about it. <laughs> I, you know, I just would have never dreamed that I would be dealing with this. When right. we were kids, we, our parents were feminists. We were raised to think... You could do anything. That, yes, we could do We'd anything. And the world had changed. And it's really sad and shocking, shocking how much the world has not changed. Now, personally, have you experienced gender bias, as far as you know? I definitely. But I think I'm really lucky. I think I've gotten as much done as I have because of my sisters, being able to work with my sisters, having people who are around me, supporting me. Um, the thing is, I think it keeps me at a certain low level. Like, I have become excellent at doing these low-budget indies. And I, I mean, the last movie I just shot, I 
don't know if they would want me to say the budget, but it was so, so low budget. And I know that I have the skills to be able to make the days. And I mean, they did not have the budget to, to go into OT at all. And right. so I was working with... So you're back to uh, your two new, lines cut. Oh, practically, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but imagine no, what you could do with $100 million. Oh, yes. And I have this movie that I have been wanting to do for years now. It's on the Mercury 13, women who were tested to be astronauts in the early yeah. 60s. And I know the reason that I relate to them so much is because when I first heard their story and they were so spectacular and and they hit the ceiling because they were women and it's so parallel to what women directors are going through. And I first went out and pitched it and I then decided I'm just going to sit down and write the script because I see this movie in my head. I just know what it is. And we wrote the script and it was optioned uh, right away by one company and they couldn't quite put the money together because I'm attached as a woman director, but would I give it up? And I said, no, I'm not going to give this but up. But that's so risky. I know. And I just said, I'm, I'm, this is my baby. This is my passion project. I am not giving this one up. And so their option ran out, and another company optioned it. And, oh, yes, we understand you're attached as director. And then very quickly they said, but we can make it if you will give up that. I said, no. Why? Why? Because it's so much easier to put together a bigger budget with a male director. Why? Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's really sad is even people who know better, they it's so hard to fight that unconscious bias yeah. that actually Stacy Smith said there's a better word for it that and I can't remember what she said now but um, the, the fact that I think it was something that it's conscious bias <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's not even that unconscious always but there are people where it is unconscious because they talk the talk but they still have difficulty putting their neck out and I just think it's because there's so many rungs that have to be gone through to, to raise a big budget. I think it's the putting your neck out piece because the people in the position to be able to make that decision, it's a big risk for them mm -hmm. and they're sure. Job. Sure. And so, sometimes I think it's a bigger risk for women because they're already maybe one of few women in their position. So I hate when other people blame, well, look at those women who are the heads of studios. Why aren't they doing it? Well, they're already having to fight extra right. hard. Do they have to take everything on so, at such right. personal risk to themselves? Exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm sympathetic. I, I wish they would, but I'm right. sympathetic. I'm not blaming them. So and how I think also it's dangerous when women are told to blame other women because there's that whole thing of you, you don't want to be fighting against yourself. I, yeah. I love how Tina Fey says that thing about we're not the enemy. We're not, we shouldn't be fighting each other. We should be helping each other. And right. so I always try and hire other women and I, I encourage, I mean, my dream would be to have enough of a, a fund where I could make all these movies of these other talented women directors I know and they're just languishing, these, these stories, these yeah. voices. It seems to me that men have to get in there and take it on. But how do we do that? There's some great men who are doing that. Um, I, I think as the data is getting out there and men are seeing that and... and often quite shocked at the reality because it isn't realize. just like oh she's just complaining because probably she's not really that talented yeah. or she would have something more would have happened by now right when you look that it's across the board oh okay i mean look at that fantastic guy at fox uh langreff who just overnight they they made the numbers that this was just an announcement last week or so that he said why does it have to be a slow process? Why not just change the numbers? Oh, Which is right. what they're doing in Scandinavian countries. Yes. And, you know, they just 
mandate it has to be a certain number and people grumble but then they change it and then it's Just forgotten it. a year later and by the way things are always better for it i mean they show that in uh business in companies where the executive suites have women they do better i mean i say that all the time <laughs> right right yeah. so i get why people are resistant because it just seems like a pain and, and you're already dealing with if you're putting together a movie that's hard enough and you don't want another hurdle but if it were just mandated certainly you know for, on the TV level that's easy enough to do so I'm thrilled that they're the you know the ACLU took it on now the EEOC I think that's going to make a big difference I think it already is yeah because people are paying attention to it well it's out there it's transparent it's like um, it's almost like we'd like to think we live in a post gender discrimination world so that we don't have to focus on it mm -hmm. when in reality we so don't mm -hmm. and it's so uncomfortable mm -hmm. and look at the whole uh, the stuff that Hillary Clinton gets oh my God. just you know it shows how deep sexism still is the and Olympics <laughs> yeah I see that coverage the, the, the Olympic coverage is getting blasted for their sexist coverage like when the woman and if, I don't know her name so I'm part of the problem now she won the shooting thing and it was the wife of the professional sports player wins medal. They didn't even say her name. Oh my goodness. When the swimmer won, they pointed to her husband and said, there's the man responsible. I mean, it's they're getting a lot of flack. But the difference is, they're getting a lot of flack. Yes. And people are talking people about are it. People are noticing it. And Twitter is shaming everybody. Good, good. So it's starting to be that people at least now see it. Yes. And yeah. once you see it, you know you can't unsee it. My sister Jen thinks that social media is going to be the thing that really makes a difference because, like you're saying, where Twitter can shame things, that people can point it out and and keep it going yeah. a little bit longer. Like the day Hillary Clinton got nominated, so pictures of Bill Clinton are on the front page, but it was called out immediately. Right, right. And it's the same, I mean... You know, I think that if people thought, oh, we live in a post-racial time because now we have a black president. And then look at all the pushback oh and God. the horrible things that, again, thank goodness for social media, that are making people not be able to just put things under the rug they yeah. used to be. But I think whenever there's a gain, there's a lot of pushback. For sure. And so... There's always been, historically, there, there are racial gains before there are gains for women, and I think that's tracking. Yeah, I think we're getting there. I was listening to an interview the other day, and she was talking about uh, the woman had grown up during the Susan Faludi backlash, mm. which is when I came of age also, I was mm -hmm. taking women's studies. And she was saying, yes, we are making huge strides, and prepare yourself. The backlash is coming. Right. <laughs> I'm like, ah! Right, right. No, but so still, I think we're seeing we another backlash. Forward. Like, the more that that we're making strides, then there's more backlash. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly in the case of if we hopefully have a woman president, it, it, it unleashes it. a lot of anger. But it's just a, a step on the in the process it's to the get there. It's the cleansing and the purging of the <laughs> so we can get there. Yeah, like the racism we've seen in the last year. Right. It just all came to the surface. Exactly. So we can... Get rid of it. <laughs> Acknowledge it. Yes. Yeah. Acknowledge we have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. My sister Jen uh, has worked with Henry Louis Gates on um, uh, African American. She did the Norton Anthology of African American Literature and uh, North Norton Anthology of African American Debates. So she is very savvy on the history of all that, and and it's. It's great to have a, a person who studied it calm you down about the history. Like this is a step toward progress, you know. Instead it's of good just to have being that perspective. so depressed about it all. Well, it, it brings so much awareness. Like I have um, biracial children, black, uh -huh. and I find myself when I'm out with them in public doing things. Where right after I have to say, you know what? That was my old white lady privilege. 
and you can't be that lippy to TSA people. Because oh. <laughs> re- we were at the airport, and I got in this guy's face because he was being so dumb, I couldn't even stand it. Um, and of course, I got away with it because I'm, you know, a 45 year old white woman. And I just had a moment of, to my black son, never talk to someone like that in authority. Right. And then I realized I have to check myself. It's made me so much aware of how I move in the world and the privilege I have, even sure. as a woman. Sure. That yes. I yeah. think it's important too. No, I, I've, I'm glad that they're able to be educated in that, but how awful that they have to grow up still in this world yeah. and, and see that. And, and on the flip side, apparently I am so lippy about feminism. They bet me last weekend that I couldn't go a day without speaking about um, feminism and gender equality. <laughs> And they baited me all day long, and then they finally got me at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> what did they get you with? Um, I had a book on my table, Shooting Women. It's a book that someone's just written about female cinematographers. Uh-huh. And my daughter very innocently, well, Mommy, why would there need to be a book about women cinematographers? Oh, like, she knew. She did, and her little eyebrow went up, and I said, because there aren't very many, you know, because of gender discrimination. Ah, you got me. But you know what's so fantastic is that... They can tease you about it, but they, they're learning it. They're getting they it. it. And the reason you're saying it every day is because there's so many occasions to point things out. I mean, that's what's so sad. I've got eight little nieces and nephews. The, the oldest is 14 and the youngest has just turned five. They're stair step. Each of my sisters <laughs> has a boy and a girl. And um, we all raise them with the every movie. We have to pause it. <laughs> I do that. Okay. Do you notice that the girl is just being the girlfriend and not, this is sexist because she's not being active and even when it's a movie you like. This is how we watch television at my house and they are so sick of it. They're like, mom, could you stop ruining everything? (laughs) But, but they get it. Right. I can, I can simmer down. Right. No, but then I see them, the older ones with their friends pointing things out like they're, they have learned this, and that's great because that's how we're going to get the next generation to be different. Yeah. I see women in their 20s now who seem to be a little casual about the fact that there's still sexism, and mm-hmm. I don't think they necessarily recognize that it's going to hit them because maybe they're... They just out of college, they're still in jobs where they are equal to their male peers. They haven't come up against it yet. And I think actually, I when I made my first film and I'm thinking I'm equal to all my male peers and I'm assuming that the way they're gonna get, they, they do get hired for their studio uh, job, that mine's just around the corner. Mm-hmm. And so, I think there was a little bit of naivete there. But what I love about the data is that we have data so that it's just very factual. You you don't have to tell these stories where you feel like you're griping. And, right. Uh, Sour you grapes. Know, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's not effective for, for, to, for people to hear. I mean, people who... <laughs> We, we like can sit story. here and, and share stories because we relate. But people who aren't having the same experience, I think it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. so when you give them data, it's so much more effective. Well, it's so powerful. Yes. It's like, ha- it's indefensible. Yes. And it's so extreme right now, too. Yeah. You know, it's not even like you're saying... Women are only 40%, and they should be 50%. You're like, they're 6%. Hello? <laughs> let's let's go wild and make it 30%. And, again, something you probably know, there's a tipping point at a certain place, and around, what is it, like 28% or something, mm-hmm. that when you have enough women in a culture, then it, the culture. it just becomes much easier to get to 50%. Yeah. So. So hopefully we will get there. Yeah, yeah. How do you think we'll get there? I hope they do some kind of mandates. And as I say, I love that this guy at Fox just did it and said we were terrible. 
and look, we can make a change, and so can you, and it's kind of trying to shame the other um, studios. John right. Langraff. John Langraff. Okay. Good. Tell me this. Are you a success? Oh, these are your questions that I I've heard now. Did you prepare? Uh, you know, it's funny. I was just listening to them until you showed up, so... Um, uh, it's interesting because I'm not as successful as I want to be. Mm-hmm. I want to make my $100 million studio features. I want to make my $20 million Mercury 13 first, which is not so difficult, but it seems to be, you know, but it's that that's the next step. That's what's going to get me out of the lower budget things. I want to be directing TV. I want to be working all the time. I love to work. That said... I see myself compared to people who are not following their dream, and I am very successful. I'm so lucky that I get to be able to do this. I mean, luck is a huge part of it. The fact that I'm born into a country and uh, privileged enough that I can family. be even thinking about this. I, I'm very aware. Yeah, and a supportive family. I'm, I'm very lucky on all those fronts and um, yet I think it's so important in our culture for women to be able to tell stories equally to men because film and and TV it's it's what reflects our, our culture and it's what perpetuates it and we need women telling those stories too so I want to be one of those women telling bigger stories. <laughs> but, you know, so it depends which side of the coin you're looking at. So my next question. Yes. Are you a badass? Ah, this question, it's interesting because I think that's a tricky question to ask women. It is. Because I think women are not allowed to be badasses as much as men. Um, you know, the whole connotation of being tough women get penalized for and then the whole connotation of being cool I think since women have to prepare a thousand times more certainly as directors we go in and and you just have to work so hard I have to work so hard to get all the projects made that I have made I don't have the luxury to just be so cool in that way you know the connotation to me of what badass means yeah interesting do you feel like you have to adjust how you communicate in the world to do what you want to do yes and I think this is something that women directors think about a lot because you have to go on set and command authority and it's not just given to you the way for men I think it's assumed women have to earn it and I'm someone who, I'm, I'm collaborate. I love collaborating. I respect what other people bring in each of the departments. And I've had to learn not to seem like I'm being too open to other people's opinions in a way that can come back as if I don't know what I want. Because I very much know what I want. But I... I have to make that known because it's not assumed. Do you have to be careful about showing vulnerability? I don't even think I show vulnerability. It's not vulnerability. It's just collaboration. Yeah. But it's... But if you leave too big of an opening... Yeah. It's that thing of, oh, she doesn't know what she wants, which I don't know if I've had that, but I know that women have to be careful of, of hearing that and I'm I'm gentle with people and I like a I like a set to be a fun pleasant experience mm-hmm. and and we're all in this together and it's stress it's uh, it's inherently stressful so let's make it as fun as it can be and and let's all be working you know bringing together everything that each person is bringing and um like the job is hard enough right so i have to to i've learned that i can't just be purely 
appreciative and nice. Nice is not a good thing for a woman director. And so because I'm not a yeller and harsh like that, I still have to be very clear about um, just establishing that I know what I want and if I'm letting someone contribute their opinion, I'm, I'm, I, I, that, that does not mean that I'm uh, acquiescing to their opinion. I'm just, I'm, I believe that everybody, Steven Soderbergh can be open to everybody's opinion and no one is questioning his genius. Yeah. And I think that's just a trickier line for a woman director. Oh, so interesting. It makes me think of Mary Poppins, firm but kind. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> in so control. So I think it's something that I'm always interested in. I'm always reading about how women do this. You know, I loved in Lean In where they talked about the way that women can negotiate differently because if you negotiate for yourself, it's not taken as well as if you're negotiating for your team or for your family or whatever it is. And I'm, I'm just always trying to refine my way of doing it. Do you think men think about that? I don't think they have to. <laughs> no. Can you imagine? You have to think about how you're going to direct the film, but then how you're going to behave while you're on set in order to be able to make it happen. And there's so many other things, too. Like, to establish myself as a director professionally, I made a conscious choice to stop wearing dresses when I went to premieres and things because I want to be seen professionally so I will wear pants and you know things right, that think about wardrobe yeah and hair and makeup yes and anyway it's a lot of things that I think women have to think about on top of doing the movie I wonder I just wonder how much men are aware of that kind of thing and if they hear you saying that if they would be like oh my god like I never knew I wonder there, there will come a point where there are enough women that then women can just be all different types and be their authentic selves on whatever uh, area in the spectrum they fall, and that's going to be great. Yeah. But right now, because it's still perceived as this male thing, I think if you're perceived as too feminine, and it, it's a difficult... But that's that works against you. Yeah. Well, like Obama, I think had to behave in a certain way and to be very careful. Mm-hmm. Once we've had twenty black presidents, maybe one day they can be angry. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Tell me this: Do you have any like crazy? This happened on a set stories. Stories from the trenches. Uh, a funny story I sometimes tell is on um, temps when we were shooting in Boston. Being independent, where you have to wear all hats, I was uh, assigned with picking up the free donuts that Dunkin' Donuts was donating before showing up at the set. So while my sisters were getting the truck and driving that to set, right. and you were directing this movie, I was directing, and you the were movie. picking up the donuts. So I show up at Dunkin' Donuts and I said, "Hi, I'm I'm here for we're supposed to pick up a couple boxes of donuts for temps and." The woman at the counter said, I don't have anything about that. And I said, oh, maybe it's under Five Sisters Productions. Oh, I don't have anything there. Maybe it's under Burton? Nothing. She went and got her manager. And I'm like, look, after going through this whole thing, I, I, I have to be on set. I, I don't have time for this. I, I need these donuts. And, and they're looking, looking through the records. I'm like, I have to go. I have to be on set. Just give me the donuts. So they, they're like, okay. So they put together two boxes of donuts, give them to me. I show up on set and they said... We had a call from the Dunkin' Donuts that you never showed up, so I'd gone to the wrong, <laughs> wrong branch, and, and these people just gave me two big boxes of donuts because I was like, look, I don't have time for this. I have to be on set. Give me the donuts. You still got them for free? I got them for free. <laughs> <laughs> they just packed them up and gave them to me because I was okay, like... Okay, lady. Look, exactly. <laughs> so then they sent someone else to go get the other donuts. So we had extra donuts that day. Yay! But, you know, that's doing everything and uh, I have I think it's been a great learning experience because I know every 
bit from pre-production to post-production of making a movie. I would like to now have enough money that I can hire other people to do all those things. And so you could just show up and direct? not have to keep doing them myself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, what would you tell young women coming up? I think getting a mentor is a really important thing that I did not do because I have all these wonderful friends in the business and I think I felt that asking friends favors would somehow sully the friendship and I didn't want to ever ask anything anyone of any mm. anything of anyone so now I realize that's ridiculous and of course you can ask your friends to help you because how much do you like helping people and yeah, and I help people all the time. Yeah. As I said, I also make an effort to hire other women. I always hire women DPs, and I try and hire women ADs, and I'm very conscious of that. And and I've helped uh, young guys, too, but I, I make a point to help young women because I know that it's harder for them. And I think that I just had that thought like I will do good work and it will be recognized and that's all it takes and yeah. then you realize you do a lot better if you have somebody championing you so that's what I would tell them you know what we didn't talk about very much is that other foundation you have girls in media mm. um, global girl media yes thank you I uh, was on the board there. It was started uh, by Amy Williams, who had been doing a lot of work in South Africa. And some, some, a young woman who had been raped in a war crime God. asked Amy about her filming. And Amy taught her to use the camera and she started documenting, documenting stories and it made such a difference in her. It gave her this power and this voice and Amy realized that there could be good work done by teaching young women and, and so that's how the organization started and as I said I saw firsthand with the two women I mentored taking to Sundance. It was, I mean, at the same time that the woman from South Africa, we were taking into the store and buying her boots because her shoes had, the soles fell out. I mean, they oh. were so, so poor. And every meal, she just, she was real thin, and, and yet she would just eat so much because here she had this opportunity. It was really touching. And part of me felt they need so much more than to be taught to use a camera, but then you realize that given a voice, is so essential and that's life changing yeah and it makes such a difference in, in ways that radiate out in the rest of their lives yeah uh, globalgirlmedia.org okay. thank you very much <laughs> thank you you've been listening to The Other 50% I'm Julie Harris Walker I'd like to thank Maria Burton for sharing her story and special thanks to Jonathan Lucas for editing, Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features and bios of our guests. Thanks for listening. See you next time. It's so nice talking with you. I hope you trim out a lot of our... Oh, no, there's no editing. It just goes out like this. <laughs> <laughs>